Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the content patch for the 17th of July 2013. My name is Total Biscuit with today's gaming news and comment. Coming on the show, Ubisoft says that they won't even start a game if they don't believe they can build it into a franchise. Video Games Live will be streamed on Twitch on July the 20th. Action games outsell shooters according to NPD figures in 2012. And competitive gaming has been recognized by the US as a pro sport for visa purposes. All this in the OC Remix track of the day is coming your way right about now. In an interview with Ailis Daily, Ubisoft confirmed in regards to its business strategy that they're not even looking at games that they don't believe they can turn into franchises. The specific quote was in response to a question that asked, do you want Watch Dogs to be the foundation of a big franchise? Tony Key from Ubisoft replied, absolutely, that's what all our games are about. We won't even start if we don't think we can build a franchise out of it. There's no more fire and forget, it is too expensive. The entire interview is fairly lengthy and detailed and also goes into Ubisoft's marketing strategy and their opinion on big budget marketing. One of the more interesting quotes, I think, is that they claim by increasing their marketing, the goal is to actually lower the risk of the title because they spent so much time, energy and money creating them that the risk that they don't sell is simply too high. So they're willing to throw a huge marketing budget at those titles, although they feel they've got significantly smarter over the years as to how to do that. Okay, let's first talk about the franchise quote, because I think that's perhaps the most controversial. So the idea is that they will not create anything that they don't believe has franchise material at this point. If you were to look at their lineup, you'll very clearly see an awful lot of franchises, some strong, some not so much. Assassin's Creed probably being their leading franchise at the moment. Watch Dogs, by the looks of it, is intended to be a franchise. Is that a problem? Not really. I think that what we have demonstrated as a market in general is that our reception to stuff that we already know we like is going to be much stronger than it would be to original IP. As much as we turn around and say, yeah, we really want original IP, we consistently prove that that is not the case by buying sequels. The biggest selling games of last year, all sequels. If you have a look at the chart track figures, which is a company that keeps an eye on the sales figures in the UK, you will note that the first 19 games on the top 20 are franchise titles. They are sequels. The first game in that list that wasn't a sequel and was actually original IP was Sleeping Dogs, coming in at number 20. Top was, of course, Black Ops 2, followed by FIFA 13, Assassin's Creed 3, Halo 4, Hitman Absolution, which is Hitman 5, Just Dance 4, Far Cry 3, FIFA 2012, Elder Scrolls 5, Borderlands 2, so on and so forth. You get the idea. The fact of the matter is that franchises are safer. It's as simple as that. Consider that Sleeping Dogs is at number 20 in the UK charts and yet was not really considered to have sold as much as Square Enix had hoped. The sales figures for that game were significantly lower. According to numbers from Square Enix, Sleeping Dogs shifted 1.7 million copies. Black Ops sold over 7.5 million copies on its launch day and is projected to sell 25 million copies. And people are actually saying that that franchise is in decline in terms of its sales. Think about that for a second. That's a franchise that's in decline and it's stomping all over stuff like Sleeping Dogs and Sleeping Dogs is a big budget AAA title with big budget voice acting in it. The fact of the matter is, franchises are safer. It's very difficult to get outside of that unless you somehow manage to reduce the budget. If you reduce the budget, you reduce the fidelity and the scope of the title. That usually means that the people making those IP risks on the new stuff are indie devs with a smaller scope as opposed to AAA devs with a larger scope. Sequels and franchises sell more copies and it's not the guys working on them that are buying them, it's us. We are buying them. I don't like the attitude. I don't. I Don't get me wrong, I like sequels, and I will happily play a sequel to a game that I enjoyed, no problem at all. But I also like new ideas, and I like them to be realized in a big budget fashion where possible. There are some titles that would really benefit from having that budget and having that marketing push behind them. There are, of course, some titles that survive just fine without it, which is why we see new IP coming to the indie scene more so than we would see it from AAA development houses. The biggest problem I've got with this, though, is not any of that. It's the idea that some games don't need to have sequels. 
Think about it for a second. Think about if Journey had to be a franchise. Would that have benefited Journey in any way? No. That game had a solid ending. That game wrapped everything up and was a perfect, complete package in and of itself. There is no way you can make a Journey 2 and not dilute the whole idea of the title. It doesn't need a sequel. And the risk of this kind of attitude being adopted means that games like Journey don't get made in the first place because they don't have that franchise potential. As much as I'm anticipating Watch Dogs, the problem I have with it is that if it's being built as a franchise, then it may progressively decline. Not only that, but it will take development talent and dollars away from other stuff. Like, you know, the next Watch Dogs. And I don't, of course, mean the sequel to that. I mean the next new IP from Ubisoft gets delayed because they're too busy working on Watch Dogs sequels, assuming that the damn thing actually sells well to begin with. It's exactly the problem that Assassin's Creed had. Yeah, Assassin's Creed 1, interesting concept, not well executed. Assassin's Creed 2, very well executed. And then what do we get? More and more and more damn Assassin's Creed. Until recently, Assassin's Creed 3, I couldn't even be arsed with it. I really couldn't. It's like, oh, it's the same bloody gameplay over and over again. This is coming out every year now. This is not that interesting to me anymore. It was an interesting new IP. Now it's just a cash cow. If we keep turning series into that, then you will eventually destroy the legacy of those titles, and that concerns me greatly. Is there any way around it, though? Well, not really, because at the end of the day, they're responding to what the market wants, that has repeatedly proven that it wants franchise titles and it wants sequels, and it rewards them with huge amounts of sales. Can you argue with that? No, you can't. <laughs> you really, really cannot. Unless there is a massive paradigm shift in what people actually desire, which is not looking like it's going to happen anytime soon, then we are not going to be seeing a change in attitude. The long-running series of concert shows by the name of Video Games Live will be coming to Twitch, sponsored by Amazon. The event in San Diego, California will be taking place on July the 20th at the Civic Theater, and the performance will be by the Pasadena Community Orchestra. This time around, they are actually streaming the event live, which is pretty damn cool. I've never actually seen a Video Games Live concert, so to me, this is certainly something that I am very much into. You can find out more information about it at Amazon.com slash Video Games Live. That is Amazon.com slash Video Games Live. This is going on during San Diego Comic Con, and there are 3,000 free seats in a first-come, first-served basis, so you might want to be a little bit quick with it. The information on how to actually get a ticket is Amazon.com slash Video Games Live. It seems that the event is also being sponsored by Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, which indicates to me that there will, of course, be Assassin's Creed music at this particular event. I don't really think that this indicates there's widespread acceptance for the notion that video game music is a valid form of musical expression, but I think it's getting there. It's the kind of thing that a very specific demographic will show up to, but there are some fantastic themes when it comes to video game soundtracks. You know that I like them. I've been trumpeting the notion that video game music is actually very good to listen to on its own for the longest time, and it's perhaps best to be able to hear the classics updated. As much as it's nice to listen to, say, Chemical Plant Zone in its original form, there's so much more that can be done with that music now that you have a full orchestra behind it. Some stuff doesn't work out, some stuff just sounds silly, but I think it's perhaps my experience when I was actually playing an instrument and I was in a military-style band. A lot of the stuff we played was actually film music, and people really like that. So as far as I'm concerned, if film music can actually get to the point where it is respected on its own, without attachment to the film, then I think the video game music can do exactly the same thing. There's actually nothing stopping it doing that at all, so it should be cool. I'm looking forward to the stream. Hopefully it doesn't suck. Figures from NPD and the Entertainment Software Association indicate that in 2012 in the US, shooters were actually slightly outsold by action games. The percentages indicate that action games were 22.3% of game sales, and that was followed by shooters at 21.2%. Sports, as you might imagine, was very, very popular indeed, with 15.3% of the sales, and that was followed, surprisingly enough, by adventure games at the figure of 8.3%, which actually beat RPGs. Admittedly, it's difficult to know exactly what they mean by adventure games there, though I have to imagine the sales of The Walking Dead significantly pumped up that particular number. Now, I suppose the question is, is there anything to be read into this? I think perhaps there is. 
it could potentially mean that in the US at least there is a shift in interest and that gamers would rather invest in an action title as opposed to a shooter title. Yeah, no, groundbreaking packed a level analysis there, isn't it? But the point is that if you look at the two genres, there's a lot more variety in the action game genre than there is in the shooter genre, because quite frankly, it's a wider genre, it's a vaguer term, and it's less trope-ridden. If we look at the sales in 2012, then of course we'd see Call of Duty Black Ops 2 pretty much topping everything, but what other big shooters actually came out in 2012 to contribute to this number? Because I remember Medal of Honor Warfighter bombing horribly, and that was EA's big release that year. Battlefield 3 came out in 2011, not 2012. So who else did you really have contributing to that genre in a big way? The answer to that would be stuff like Borderlands 2, Halo 4, Far Cry 3. And then you compare it to the number of action games last year. I mean, there was a lot of them. And I suppose it really comes down to what you define as an action game. I have to assume that shooters only really covers first-person shooters. That means that action gets third-person games, spectacle fighters, action platformers, things like that. We're talking the difference between God of War and Uncharted there, which are both kind of shoved into the same genre. I think if you were to read anything into this, it's that the shooter genre is advancing slower than the action genre, as it were. And it's simply because the FPS genre is very much trapped in tropes. You have two kinds of FPS right now. You've got the obfuscated corridor, and then you have the open world. And you've got games like Borderlands 2, and you've got games like Far Cry 3 that fit into that open world, and then you've got games Games like Call of Duty, you've got games like Halo 4 that actually fit into the obfuscated corridor idea. And then if you look at them, aside from Borderlands 2, pretty much every one of those games has the same multiplayer with the same ideas and the same progression system, and they all work in a very similar way. There's some minor changes here and there, but a massive paradigm shift in that genre has not happened for quite some time. And I think as a direct result, you are going to see that slight fall off in sales and it's going to keep happening, whereas people are going to eventually get bored of the same thing over and over again. This is very true when you think about multiplayer. You can try and distinguish the single player campaigns of the titles that I just listed all you please. Throw Borderlands 2 out the window because it's an FPS RPG and it doesn't actually have competitive play, but everything else that you see from this genre is going to be based around that same progression system. And as a direct result, I feel that less people actually want to get on the treadmill every year. And you're going to see that decline. And then you look at action games and it's like, oh, not only are you getting a compelling single player story, and I think that there is the bigger focus when it comes to action games and single player than there currently is when it comes to FPS. It's weird to say that if you look at last year's titles, considering that Far Cry 3 had a big single player focus. But if you look at Borderlands 2, very much should be played in multiplayer. Call of Duty, very much a multiplayer title. Halo 4, very much a multiplayer title, even though it did have a reasonable campaign. And then you look at action games, and some of them are just completely ignoring multiplayer altogether, which is a fantastic idea when you think about it. So, I, I don't know. Maybe this is indicative of something. Maybe people are just getting sick of brown FPS. That's a possibility. But I have a feeling that these numbers are slightly misleading because you are looking at a very specific genre, first-person shooters, versus a much wider genre, action games. And finally, I'm a little bit late to this particular discussion because I was deciding whether or not to actually talk about it, but I think that overall it's probably a good idea. I have some very specific experience in this. Whatever the case, competitive gaming has been recognized by the US in visa terms as a pro sport. What this basically means is that those looking to travel to the United States to compete in esports events will be eligible for athlete visas. This news was broken in regards to the LCS, which is looking to be one of the biggest esports events in the West so far far, and this would appear to have been spearheaded by Riot Games. It is obviously in their interests to do so, especially considering their LCS competition requires the top teams to actually reside in one specific place. It may very well be that those teams can't do so because of visa restrictions. Now, this is a little bit of a dirty secret for esports, but I have to say this, up until this point, an awful lot of players have been living in specific countries working under the visa waiver program, which they're not actually allowed to do. 
The visa waiver program is available across a wide variety of different countries and it's really designed for tourism purposes. It's designed so that you can enter the country either on a short piece of business or go and have a holiday there and then leave and not have to worry about any kind of complex visa proceedings. It is not designed for you to move into the country on a semi-permanent basis and actually work for an organization there. You need a work visa for that. And that is a little bit trickier to get and also has a number of different restrictions. It also means that we've had players specifically denied entry to the US for competitions on the basis that they've spent too much time in the country over the past 12 months. That has happened to numerous Korean players. It has even happened to a European or two. Now, in this case, what these visas allow you to do is to access the country to play in a competition as well as move on a semi-permanent basis to work. Now, they gave an example of Danny Lee, who has actually moved over to join Team Coast. He was in Canada. He's now eligible to move to the US and actually play and work for his particular team. Up to this point, I would imagine that there are several players for various esports teams involved in various esports that have not been doing that the legit way. Do I blame them? No. I have a very biased perspective when it comes to this because I've actually been through this visa proceeding and I'm also one of the people that got an O1B visa on the basis of my esports casting. For those who don't know, the O1B is specifically titled as a visa for individuals with an extraordinary ability in the arts or extraordinary achievement in motion picture or television. Now, this has a wider application than you might think. You look at that and it's like, right, that's for TV and movie stars, right? Yes, but you'd actually be surprised by how forward-thinking a lot of these organizations actually are if they can be convinced. What my lawyer, with the support of the IGN Pro League, which I was actually coming over to cast, was able to do was to prove to the guys over at the USCIS that I had an extraordinary ability in terms of internet broadcasting. So they were talking about my achievements with YouTube and they were talking about my achievements with esports events. And that actually got me through without too much of a problem. After we eventually got all the evidence in and spent a ridiculous amount of money to do it, the actual interview to get it wasn't too tough. And I was able to gain access to the US legally that way. So this is not the first time this has happened. I'm one of the guys that legally got in under the O visa program and O1A actually applies to athletics, which I would imagine that quite a few people are going to be attempting to get. The problem with O1 visas in general is they're actually quite expensive. So the acquisition of these things could be costly. I think the overall cost to me and to IPL to actually get me into the country was probably more than $10,000. It was a very, very pricey process. Admittedly, we did get a pretty good lawyer to make it happen. So the viability of this for a lot of teams may very well not be there. I have to wonder whether or not this shift in ideas is going to make the process easier and less costly. You've got to bear in mind that the longer the process is, the more you have to pay the lawyers to get it done. You can do it yourself, but my God, is it complex. Trust me, we tried. It's good. And this is the kind of thing that should be happening anyway. It's very beneficial to the United States, obviously, because laws when it comes to prize money enable them to tax it, which is, of course, beneficial. I mean, there's no real reason for this not to be in place. It just really comes down to the fact that the overall immigration process for the United States is a goddamn mess, as I have experienced to my loss for several years. So while it was already possible for esports figures to actually acquire these visas, this will hopefully make it significantly easier. It's good news, I think, for pretty much everybody. All right, folks, that does me for the day. Thank you very much for watching the content patch. But before I go, I'd like to give you the OC Remix track of the day. We don't have enough jazz on this show. I'm pretty much convinced of that. So let's alleviate it with a remix from Scott Peoples. This is from a game that I imagine most of you have played or at least know about. This remix actually came out three years after the game did. The game came out in 1997. This was one of the first remixes on OC Remix in the year 2000 and it is by Scott Peoples and Mustin. The original song is called Control, and the original composers were Graham Norgate, Grant Kirkhope, and Robin Beanland. It's a little bit of jazz. It's called Control Jazz from GoldenEye007. I'll see you next time. <laughs>